myself. Uh, let me say welcome once again, and I would ask that if, um, if you're joining us from wherever in the world, just kind of drop us a note, let us know where you're watching from, uh, so we can kind of see what community we have uh, joining us today. Uh, this is our, gosh, I think our third or fourth live cooking event, uh, and we call it Come Together in the Kitchen or the Gesundheit Kitchen Live, but ultimately it's a great way for us to virtually get together, have some fellowship, ask questions, celebrate food, celebrate the fact that we can even be talking about food because I know for a lot of you and myself included, there was a period during my, um, my cancer journey where food was uh, kind of a blessing and a curse kind of a thing where I had this love-hate relationship with food where I love food, I love working with food, but I didn't really enjoy eating it because I wasn't smart about it in those early years. And so it's kind of been my mission over the last dozen plus years to try to educate folks about that intersection, that connection between what we eat and how we feel. And there's so many things on this cancer journey that we can't control, but nutrition is one of the things, one of the few things really that we can 100% grasp uh, with both hands and we get to decide every day how we're gonna fuel this machine. So whether you are kind of, no matter where you are on the spectrum of this journey, whether you've just been diagnosed, whether you've had a partial gastrectomy, a total gastrectomy, or you might be a caregiver who is trying to care for someone who is uh, GI compromised, really how you fuel this machine, which is an analogy I use quite a bit, really makes a, a significant impact on how you or the patient that you're caring for feel. So that's always something I'm going to kind of go back into. So again, do me a favor, check in, let us know that you're here, let me know where you're watching from. And if at any point you have questions, we're going to kind of every now and then stop and uh, I'll check in with and see if we have questions along the way. Um, one of the challenges is not overeating, especially during the holidays. As we come into Thanksgiving, as we come into uh, you know uh, Hanukkah and Christmas and even New Year's, there's always food and food and food and food and food. So um, it takes a lot of self-control to make sure that you're not overeating and you have to really kind of think about, I always think about it like brackets, right? There, there's sort of my, my parentheses. And so there's all this food in the world and then there are the things that I can eat. And rather than focusing on all the things that I really can't eat, I try to really zone in on the things that I can eat. And then you try to find interesting and unusual and flavorful and delicious ways to, to work within those brackets. Um, so given the amount of time that we have today and, and coming into the holidays, I didn't want to spend a lot of time working on uh, you know, a roast or things like that. It seems like almost anywhere you go, someone's going to bring the ham or the turkey or the roast chicken or, or whatever it is. Oh wow, Good. some some uh, some folks already checking in here. Um, so I'm going to focus on a couple sides today, and these are things that might have a slight holiday theme, but there are also things you can use year-round, uh, and you can also use them in multiple capacities. So I always try to think of, I love the idea if you can cook once and eat twice or thrice or four times or more, I think that those are great recipes and things that you'll go back to. Um, something that takes you all day in the kitchen might be fun once, but it's really Again, it's not practical for somebody that needs to eat multiple times through the day. You want to have things that are, that are delicious, of course, because if, if they're not tasty, you're not going to eat them. Nutritious, of course, but also user-friendly, things that you can, can make uh, quite, quite easily. Uh, just looking real quick here, we have folks from uh, Wisconsin, from Lithuania. Wow, that's so far, that's, the, that's our farthest one. Uh, from New York, from, from Boston, from Florida, from San Francisco from Scotland, also not, not around here, uh, from LA. So we got a, we got a, a nice uh, selection so far. And I know we have a, a friend in Russia who's gonna be tuning in, and I've got family in Germany that uh, are usually nice enough to watch and sometimes heckle. Um, so I, I think this is awesome. And you know, even when we are not live, anytime you guys have nutrition questions, please feel free to uh, message them on, on Facebook. Uh, or you can uh, send emails or do the Facebook Messenger thing. I, you know, it's, there is no stupid question. And, and quite honestly, and some of you know my story, but early on in my diagnosis, I was given a lot of uh, well-intentioned but really misinformed information, right? There were things that from nutritionists who meant well and they knew what they were talking about for a, uh, I'm going to use my air quotes here, for a normal person, uh, but for, for someone that doesn't have a stomach, 
it's, you know, the things on paper that might work for a, a different patient just aren't going to work for somebody that doesn't have uh, the stomach to cut, especially the stomach acid, that will kind of break some of these foods down. So on paper, you're thinking calories, and where do calories usually come from, or at least the highest numbers come from, uh, sugars and fats and, and oils and things like that. But those are just technically hard for us to digest, hard for us to absorb. Uh, we might be able to chew and swallow them fine, but once they kind of sit in the, in the fuel tank, so to speak, uh, we have a limited capacity storage-wise, just in volume, but also the body uh, gets hit too fast with too much, uh, which can cause dumping syndrome, uh, which is sometimes called latent um, hypoglycemia or reactive hypoglycemia. And uh, then you get kind of weak and shaky and your, your blood sugar kind of tanks. And so it becomes this whole complex thing. But the reality is if we make smarter choices on the front end, uh, we don't have so many issues than after we've eaten it. So um, I, I really want to be conscious about what we're eating. And I, I, uh, I do a lot of patient mentoring personally. Uh, and I was connected with a, a newer patient here in the last month or so named Barbara. And Barbara was really having a, a tough time. And honestly, once she kind of reset, thought about her food, started eating like a diabetic, and, and I talk about that a lot, um, that's sort of the, the quick answer on how to eat without a stomach. Well, usually my joke answer is when someone says, how do you eat without a stomach? I'm like, well, usually with a knife and fork, uh, sometimes with a spoon. It depends on the, what I'm eating. But anyway, the best advice I was given, the short answer was get a diabetic cookbook and kind of follow that. I, I'd never heard of glycemic index, uh, even though I had two grandparents that were diabetic. I didn't know what, uh, I knew that they had to watch their sugar, but uh, I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know how sugar kind of worked within the body and the whole thing with the glycemic index and how fiber plays into that. So uh, if you don't know those things, don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid to ask questions because I spent my entire life working with food and I didn't really fully understand how food connected with the body and how the body processes food until I lost my stomach. And obviously that's a, a bit of a slap in the face, you know, throw them in the deep end kind of education. But man, am I now hyper aware and hyper-focused on what, uh, what works. Uh, I've talked a lot and haven't made a lick of food, so let me start cooking some things. I, uh, we're, we're set up today in the, the Southern Appalachian Folk Art School, uh, and it's a great little facility, but it's not a kitchen, so I'm kind of MacGyvering this, but it's a great quiet space uh, where we can have all of our, you can't see behind the scenes, but there's this whole spaghetti nest of, of wires and cables and computers, and of course camera ops, um, making this all happen, and so this is just a great space for that. Uh, so I'm using a little induction cooktop, but you don't need anything fancy like that, just a skillet. And what I want to put together is kind of a variation on Hop and John. And we did, um, we did a beans and rice kind of a thing uh, in our superfoods segment, but um, I want to kind of bring in some mushrooms, specifically uh, shiitake mushrooms, which I think uh, around the holidays, something about mushrooms um, just have that sort of umami, meaty uh, kind of a thing. And beans and rice are so great for us. You know, um, there's a lot of evidence showing that really the least amount of cancer in our country since we've been keeping records was during the Great Depression. And it mainly is because we couldn't afford to eat meat. And also the, the things we ate the most of were beans and rice and rice and beans and beans and rice in any combination. And um, any time you can eat beans and rice, number one, you get the, the fiber, which uh, if you know my friend, Dr. Ellen Steinberg, who's done a lot of videos with me, she's always talking about the importance of fiber, how it slows down the motility, slows down your gut, and also makes, um, makes it easy for our body to regulate those, uh, those spikes in blood sugar. And by slowing things down, it allows for, number one, your, uh, the, the bacteria in your gut to kind of do their job. It, it feeds them. You've heard the term prebiotics. Uh, and the fiber is essentially a prebiotic, um, but also you get tons of protein from the beans. And also I'm using a, uh, a whole brown rice, which you get that extra layer of fiber. Well, so some protein in there, but this particular rice blend has uh, quinoa in there. And quinoa is one of those, uh, you know, kind of superfood grains that um, is crazy high in protein for the, the amount of space that it takes up. And it's also easy to digest. So I'm going to make a variation on what we call dirty rice here in the south and uh, dirty rice sometimes is made with uh, with ground beef but I'm going to use the mushrooms instead uh, so I'm going to get some olive oil going 
And, you know, anytime you're doing kind of a, a dish where you're sauteing something, you want to do your aromatics first. And by that, I would mean things like garlic, onions, if you're using carrots or celery or fennel, uh, that's the time you would want to get them is at the beginning because you want to flavor the oil so that when you're, when you're cooking the other ingredients, that kind of acts like paint and then paints every grain, every bean with that that flavor. If you, you can add spice and flavor at the end a little bit, but you're not getting the full impact of it. And sometimes then you'll hit these pockets of, of spice or salt or pepper. Uh, so it's better to kind of make it a little homogenous at the beginning. And this is a uh, sweet onion. We're past the Vidalia season, but it's still a yellow sweet onion. It's about half of an onion. Uh, I am notoriously bad about measuring anything, but it's nice when you have these kind of uh, half cup bowls so you can see that's roughly about a half cup. Um, so there's our sweet onion. And the thing about onions, depending on the season, like if it was Vidalia onion season, again, I'm from Georgia, um, and they are so incredibly sweet, you could use a whole onion and they're easy to digest. They don't cause a lot of uh, bloating or gassiness or whatnot because they're just a really low sulfur onion. But if it's the middle of winter and you can't find a sweet onion, then you could even omit this or you could go just use a, you know, a, a quarter of an onion or a, uh, an eighth of an onion just as you, uh, as you can tolerate. I love the flavor of a sweet onion. Um, and then, you know, one of the things I've talked about too, like any other activity you do, if I decided tomorrow I wanted to start lifting weights and I went with 100 pound dumbbells, I would be so sore the next day and I would think, oh my God, I'm allergic to exercise. I can't, you know, I can't do this. It's the same with eating. Like, so depending on where you are in your recovery or in your journey, or if you're not used to eating a lot of uh, high fiber foods like beans or rice, the first time you eat them, if you eat a lot of them, you might feel a little bloated or gassy. So um, you might have to kind of step into this, right? You might have to kind of train yourself up to eating these uh, higher fiber foods. Um, so don't be one and done. Like if you eat something like this and you think, oh, maybe a little bloated, maybe you just need to back off of it just a little bit, eat them with other foods, and then you can kind of train yourself up to that. Um, I make a spice blend called Lucky 7, but you don't have to have that. This is essentially a mixture of things like coriander, cumin, uh, bay leaf, uh, black pepper, a little cinnamon in there. But the main spice that I would recommend, if you, if you don't have something like this, it's similar to a garam masala, which is a uh, an Indian spice blend, kind of in the same family as a curry. Doesn't have the turmeric in there, but cumin is cumin and coriander are really the flavors that I I love to add with with beans. They're great friends, uh, and they really do complement each other incredibly well. So now I'm going to add my mushrooms again. These are shiitake mushrooms. Uh, I've got more than I need for this preparation, so I'm going to put about again probably a little over a little over half a cup. This is a bigger one here. Uh, and I want to sweat these down a little bit, and this is going to flavor everything as well. And the mushrooms, they absorb a lot of that oil, so I might end up add, adding, I will end up adding a little more liquid to this in the, in the form of olive oil. And you can use uh, any high temp oil like canola or avocado or grapeseed oil. So this is um, olive oil, but it is not extra virgin olive oil. Not, not that there's anything wrong with extra virgin olive oil, it's a great oil, uh, but when you're using high temperature, extra virgin just doesn't hold up as well as just a standard olive oil. And this again has a great flavor. So that's probably another two tablespoons I'm gonna throw in there. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add a little salt. And this is just a sea salt white pepper blend that I make. Uh, and then in this grinder, I, I just have some uh, fennel seeds, white pepper again, uh, some black pepper. I just like to have uh, some spice on hand that you can uh, grate or grind at the moment because that's when those essential oils get released uh, and that's when they're at their most intense. And again, by adding these early, I'm getting the most flavor out of this. Now that on its own, that's fantastic. Like if you are you know, if you are still eating a lot of meat, I have a hard time with, uh, with eating lots of meat, so I, I do a lot of vegetarian things, but this on top of a piece of broiled fish or on top of a thin pork chop uh, would be fantastic. So just some great sauteed mushrooms. They get a little bit of coloration on there, a little uh, caramelization, some browning on there the, with a the spice that smells amazing. That's great to have, um, and it's good, honestly, hot or cold. 
And then to that, I'm gonna add my rice, and I've got equal parts here, about a cup of each, uh, kind of depending on how many you're cooking for, right? So uh, this is a good amount to have on hand for uh, a lunch, uh, but if, um, probably got too many beans there, so about equal parts of our beans. These are uh, red field peas, and these actually were grown in, uh, in South Carolina, and it's a variety that reportedly came over with some of the, the early, um, I guess you would, uh, they were slaves that came over that escaped, uh, but they had brought with them uh, from Africa these peas, sometimes they're called pigeon peas, uh, or the red peas, and they also brought okra with them, and also certain varieties of rice. So this is really popular in the south, especially along the coast. If you look into Savannah, Charleston, uh, going all the way down into Florida, along the coast, this is just a, a very popular thing to have beans and rice, particularly with these little red peas or the, the rounder pigeon peas. But I often eat for breakfast. I'll have some of this on hand. Um, I you know I'll make intentionally too much so that I have it on hand when I'm hungry. And then if I want a quick breakfast, I'll take and saute some of this out. And some of you have seen enough of my videos to know what I'm about to say. I will then fry an egg and put it on top of this. And man, what a great breakfast that is. Or uh, I will take three or four eggs and beat them up and kind of make a, like a frittata. So I would pour then the beaten eggs all over something like this and kind of work it in and set it in between all the little things, smooth it flat, throw it in the oven, and it'll set like a, like a giant quiche. Uh, a frittata and then you can slice wedges of that and just to have a mushroom beans and rice uh, frittata especially on a cold day uh, it is perfect comfort food but you get all of the benefits of that high fiber the protein not to mention the flavor uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this sucker off here well there we go um, I'm gonna let this sit and we'll work on the next dish but this is the kind of thing, again, it would be great as the base for any meal. If you had a, you know, your chicken thigh or something you wanted to set on top of there or as a side dish. And even when this gets cold, you can make a very simple vinaigrette, throw in some, uh, some greens and make a, a cold beans and rice salad. So I love the idea. Anytime you can cook once and eat multiple times, especially there, if you're going through chemo and radiation, there are going to be windows where you know that you need to eat but you don't have that you start feeling nauseous or you just don't have that hunger then you'll have a, a little window of opportunity where you think oh i could eat something right now but if it takes an hour to cook the rice and if you have to soak the beans overnight and it takes an hour to cook those after you've soaked them overnight it you it, there's so many steps involved that instead of cooking a little bit of rice go ahead and cook a lot of rice you can freeze it uh, same with the beans par cook them and have them have them on the ready and then when you're hungry, you can just pull those out and then in any combination. So at any time in my fridge, which drives my slightly OCD wife crazy, I will have different components of things that are par cooked ready on hand. So when it's time to eat, I can just go through and grab those things out. Um, I did want to mention, I kind of forgot up front here, on the shiitake mushrooms, when you, uh, when you get them, typically they will have the stem on them. Now, the shiitake stems, unlike sort of your regular button mushroom stems, they are edible, but they're super, super fibrous. Uh, so I save these, and then when I have enough of them, I'll, I'll put them in a Ziploc bag, throw them in the freezer. When I get a handful or two, then I'll make a, a mushroom stock with these. So they're, they've got a great, super pungent mushroom flavor, but if I were to put them in this dish, you would be chewing all day long. So they really are too fibrous, too woodsy to eat but I wouldn't just throw them in the compost bin or in the trash can because there's some serious mushroom flavor in there. And then all I did was just slice these caps up into, into slivers as you see here. And that's our mushroom dirty beans and rice, um, which we'll plate here in a second. Now, let me shift focus away from that. I should actually look, do we have any questions from anybody? Oh, there's, our, there's my cousin Toby from, from Germany. And I got some local folks. What's that? Scroll it. Gotcha, gotcha. We got Australia. Super nice. All right, so no questions as of yet, but we got people from all over the world, which I think is pretty awesome. And even somebody trying to call me, of course, in the middle of uh, something live. That's just the way that happens. All right, so we're going to move away from that for a second and then put together our, I'm making a beet salad. 
And I, I love beets. I, uh, I've talked about beets before on the Gesundheit Kitchen. They, they kind of sit like little uh, vegetarian or vegetable magnets in the earth, and they pull in so many great minerals. And honestly, that color is fan fantastic. The flavor is fantastic, but they're also, they're, they're really good at absorbing flavor or being good vehicles for flavor. And especially right now when it's cranberry season, where everybody thinks about cranberries for the holidays, um, they're in that same color range. And just like with the cranberries, they tend to color everything that they come in contact with. So rather than trying to avoid that, I'm just gonna celebrate the redness of this, uh, of this salad. And um, I do wanna talk just for a second about the cranberries. I've, I've done this before. You can, you can scroll back and see in the Gesundheit Kitchen uh, history um, that cranberries are so easy to make. Uh, and it is a shame to use the canned, what I call cranberry sauce, which is really not a sauce. If you look at the ingredients of canned cranberry sauce, uh, the typical one, number one ingredient is cranberries, which is good then goes high fructose corn syrup, then goes water, then goes regular corn syrup. So there's actually more corn in there. There really should be cornberry syrup uh, based on how much corn is in that. Uh, is in that. And that, the, especially the corn syrup and especially the high fructose corn syrup is gonna cause those kind of crazy blood sugar crashes. Um, so it, it's almost embarrassing how simple good cranberry sauce is to make. It's just one uh, here in the States, they come in a 12 ounce package, which is essentially three cups of, of cranberries. And you can use either the fresh or the frozen. I've got some, some fresh sitting here. And, uh, but even the frozen ones, you don't have to thaw them. You can go straight into the pan. Then you'll use one cup of any liquid and kind of depending on what direction you want to take it, you can use water, you can use orange juice, you can use triple sec if you're feeling fancy. Um, I've used apple cider before. Um, so it's so easy, one cup of liquid, this particular one I use orange juice because I love that combination of cranberry and orange together, and then typically one cup of sugar. But again, for folks that have issues with blood sugar, I now use um, stevia, but I use a granulated stevia. Now, uh, Truvia is a, is a brand that it has that kind of, it has the consistency of sugar, it cooks like sugar, um, it actually can even brown like sugar. So this was made with a cup of orange juice, a cup of Truvia, uh, and then the three cups of, uh, of fresh berries in this case, but again, frozen berries uh, are great. And so when the berries go on sale, right now they're like three bucks a pack. Uh, at the end of the holidays, they're gonna be like 50 cents a pack. So you can buy tons of cranberries and they're great all year round. Uh, and I essentially just brought the, the mixture of those three ingredients, cranberries, orange juice, and the Truvia, I brought them to a boil and cooked them down until the berries didn't disappear. I like it to where the berries kind of pop. Uh, and then you get this chunky style cranberry sauce, but it is fully gelled, as, as you would say. You know, so it's, it's got a nice uh, viscosity to it. Uh, and that is great in salad dressings, and which is essentially what I'm going to do with here. It's great as a sandwich spread. Um, it's just to have that little sweet, sour pop whenever you need it. It's even good with, uh, with yogurt. Um, like a, just a vanilla yogurt with a spoonful of that in here, and man, that is, uh, that is good eating. And it's good all year round. It's high in vitamin C, so you're not going to get your scurvy. Uh, so I, my brain right now is so full of cranberry information. I, I co-host a podcast called But I Digest, and um, the episode that is coming out on Tuesday is all about cranberries. So if you're interested in the history of cranberries, and I learned that uh, fresh, ripe cranberries bounce. In fact, they used to be called bounce berries. That one just bounced into my rice dish, but anyway, but I digest. I'm, I'm digressing. Uh, let's get to our salad. Uh, so I've got beets. This is about two baseball, maybe softball sized beets. Once they get bigger than that, they get real fibrous and woody. So I like to find ones that are about the size of a, of a baseball. And uh, I just steam them until they are knife tender. And then while they're still hot, you can just take some paper towels and just rub the skin. The skin just comes right off. Uh, another thing that you can um, you can do is put them in the oven, just like a baked potato. So you can just brush a little butter or olive oil on there, a little salt, put them in the oven. Uh, 375 takes maybe, depending on the size, maybe 25 minutes, again, until they're knife tender. And you can eat the skin, too. So if you've, if you've already scrubbed all of the dirt off of there on a roasted beet, I would just eat skin and all. Uh, but for this salad, I wanted to have it a little, little nicer for the holidays. So I've got, again, two beets that I have cooked until they were just knife tender. I peeled them, 
cut them into bite-sized pieces. Those are going to go into the salad. And you can see, uh, you might even be able to see from my hands, uh, when I peeled them this morning, you always end up with, uh, with some beet juice on there. You get caught red-handed. Uh, and then I'm going to add some couscous. Now, you can use any grain. Rice would work fine. You could use uh, whole grain sorghum. You could use um, quinoa if you wanted to. But I wanted to use couscous, which technically is a pasta. But I'm using a whole wheat couscous because that way it is the entire grain. And again, that's going to make it a little, um, uh, it's going to slow down our motility. It's going to soften the impact of any, any sugars you might have with the meal. Uh, and it has a, a nice kind of a nutty flavor to it and also a great little bit of a chew uh, to it as well. So it's not gluten-free. I don't have gluten issues. Uh, if you do have gluten issues, you can find gluten-free couscous. Uh, but this is cooked. I always have to say that because one time I forgot to say that and someone put the, uh, the uncooked grain or couscous in there and it was just way too crunchy. Uh, so in we go with the, uh, the couscous. Again, cooked couscous, the whole wheat. And then I also love, you know, we already mentioned cranberries go great with citrus. These are um, grapefruit and orange, what they call supremes or suprems. Basically, they're the segments, and you can do this yourself, or you can buy them refrigerated, just pour out the liquid, uh, which you can actually use that liquid to make your cranberry sauce. Um, so this is about, you know, a cup or so, about, about an orange or a small grapefruit worth of, of segments. Let's get that out of the way. And then, rather than making a separate salad dressing that I pour on top of this, this is going to be just a simple assembly-style salad dressing. So I'm going to put a good heaping spoon of our cranberry orange sauce into that. We can always add more. I'm going to put a couple good cranks of good sea salt. And again, this sea salt blend that I use has a little white pepper in there. I like using white pepper because it has um, it has that same sort of pepper, you know, spice to it without being overwhelming. But it also doesn't look like little little flecks of uh, of dark in there. So it's kind of it kind of disappears into the dish. Uh, and then I'm going to put a good uh, glug. Glug is a technical kitchen term. Uh, of, a, of a good vinegar, of a good light vinegar. Uh, this particular one is uh, honey and Meyer lemon, and I thought that the Meyer lemon would go well with this. And this this brand actually is a is a living vinegar, so it's got uh, probiotics in there. I know that uh, kind of freaks some people out the idea that there's things alive in there, but I promise you, it is for your benefit. It's you know when you start looking into probiotics and learning about probiotics, we are these giant uh, sort of buses. We are. We are these vehicles for uh, the probiotics. It's our job to keep them happy, and if we keep the probiotics happy, they will keep our guts happy. So that's, that's a rabbit hole I really went down as I was relearning how to eat, what I should eat, what I shouldn't eat. Uh, the addition of probiotics is great, but also incorporating uh, probiotic-rich foods, like things like sauerkraut or yogurt or kimchi or kefir or um, kombucha. There's so many great probiotic foods that are so delicious, and why would you not want to add them to your diet? Uh, number one, they're again, they're, they're delicious, but they're great for you. This kind of a salad will sit well in the fridge for days, so you can go back to it again and again. Uh, and if you are contributing to the family's holiday meals, both of these things are the kind of things you could make ahead of time. So instead of having to stress the day of the event, you could make it the night before and then reheat them or just keep this chilled. Uh, and serve it. Uh, and I'm going to serve this with a little bit of homemade sprouts. And I mentioned that because this is so easy to do. And sprouts are expensive if you buy them. And also, if you buy sprouts, oftentimes they are a potential source of contamination. They can have um, uh, salmonella or E. coli on them. Um, and so, if doing it yourself, I found you can do it in a regular jar. I found this little gadget uh, on Amazon. So easy to do. And all you do is Twice a day, you just kind of fill the thing with water and swirl it around, and then you just pour the water back out. And then you are, uh, you. It, this is about four days worth of growth. And then all you do is, when you're ready to harvest it, you just pop this sucker out and you've got all these delicious sprouts. This probably cost me 10 cents. Uh, not the container, the container was probably, I don't know, 10, 12 bucks. But this the amount of sprouts probably cost me a dime. And you can smell when you make them. They just smell fantastic. This is a mix of uh, radish and broccoli and, and lentils, and I've got sprouts on my nose now from smelling that. That's always a side effect, but anyway, if they smell off at all, if they smell kind of 
sour or kind of, um, I hate to say I hate to use the word rotten, but you'll smell something a little off, um, then you would throw them away. And the worst thing you've done is you've wasted 10 cents in a couple days. But if you change that water a couple times a day, um, and you don't even really need light for this, they'll do their own thing. And then once they reach the, the sproutingness that you like, you can just throw them in the fridge and they'll last for days. And again, I'll still every day kind of put some fresh water in there, swirl it around, dump it back out. Um, but it's a, it's a great thing to do. And they're so good on their own. One, how does it go? One teaspoon, no, one tablespoon of broccoli sprouts is the equivalent of eating an entire head of broccoli as far as nutrition value goes. So this is when they are at their most potent and their most uh, nutritionally dense. And again, they're, they're next to free and so easy to do. And I honestly believe that when you are taking care of something that helps take care of yourself, right? Like being mindful about how something else is doing and thriving. So this kind of comes like a little pet for a few days. Maybe I shouldn't use that analogy because then you end up eating your pet, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's a chia pet. It's exactly like a chia pet. Um, but you know, those, you focus your energy on keeping something healthy and you see that, that sort of correlation between, you know, giving it, giving it light and, and fresh water. And, you know, I, I think there is something about that. And I, which is why I think we, you know, again, if you're a caregiver, uh, make sure you are taking care of yourself too. Uh, but, taking care of other things, whether it's a house plant or sprouts or a pet, um, kind of makes you very mindful about making sure that you're taking care of, of other things as well. So um, I know that's, that might seem a little touchy feely, but I, I really do believe that. I'm a, I've, I've been, uh, I was raised by my, my dad who had a green thumb, two green thumbs, and I'm proud that I've kind of uh, inherited his green thumbs uh, and love of plants. And I think especially there were times that I didn't feel well, but I knew I had to go take care of the garden or I had to go out and take care of the plants. And that kind of motivated me sometimes when I didn't feel 100%, it motivated me to get out of bed and get dressed and, and uh, go take care of, of something else other than myself. And then I in turn ended up taking care of, of myself. So there's our sprouts. And one last thing, I've got some green onion from my, uh, from my garden. Just a little bit of green onion on top of that, um, of our beans and rice there, if you can tolerate it. And again, if you can't tolerate it, skip it. You can also add, you know, things like parsley or cilantro. You can take it in any direction. Um, I am now, gosh, 16 years out from my initial diagnosis, um, but I'm only two years out from my most recent surgery. So there have been times where onions are, uh, are copacetic, you know, I'm, I'm fine with them. And there are times where onions are a little too much for me. So uh, in those moments, I might skip the onion and add some, some parsley or, or whatnot. So you can always kind of adjust what you're eating based on where you are. Here's some nasturtium, which is an edible flower from my garden as well. They're kind of peppery and delicious. But these are two simple, easy to prepare, nutritious, and I think visually uh, appealing side dishes that you could contribute to your family's holiday meal or this could be uh, a part or even could be your holiday meal and it's there are things that uh, are easy to digest high in protein and overall really good for you so that's what i wanted to focus on so i'm going to shut up for a minute which is sometimes hard for me to do and uh, see if anybody has some questions what have we got uh Ooh. So yeah, uh, Steinpilz uh, is the German word for what you typically see as porcinis, and man, they are delicious. I um, I am a a huge fan of mushrooms, and she mentioned uh, chanterelles as well. Um, I, as I mentioned, my dad had green thumbs. He also was a bit of a forager, and so we would go into the mountains here and around Jasper, Georgia, and the Appalachians, uh, and we would harvest things like ramps, which are the wild onions that grow here. Uh, but also chanterelles or morels, or uh, even rarely we would have the porcinis. They seem to like a little uh, colder, colder climates. Um, but yes, they would work incredibly well here. Now, they, you know, all of those have different textures. The, the steinpilz or the porcinis need a little longer cooking time because they're very firm and they're very spongy, whereas the chanterelles you know, are a little more fragile and say they would, they would fall apart. So, um, but all of them would work incredibly well in there. But if you can't find those, just your good um, creminis, which are, are sometimes called baby portobellas, 
would work great, portobellos would work great in here, but even the, the good old fashioned ubiquitous uh, button mushroom would work in here as well. Uh, like a lot of foods, the darker the color of the mushroom, they tend to have more in, in terms of vitamins or antioxidants, uh, but also with mushrooms, it's, the darker ones seem to have a lot more uh, flavor. If I mentioned foraging, but just make sure you know what you're doing if you're foraging because there are some poisonous lookalikes. Um, so buy them from a reputable dealer or someone at the market that knows what they're doing or someone that actually has a mushroom farm. Um, and again, if you are a forager, luckily in our area, there are no poisonous lookalikes for the, like the chanterelles, which are normally what I go after, but I know in, in the northern uh, parts. And of course, we've got people from Lithuania and Germany and Russia watching uh, too. Just make sure you know what you're doing before you go out and start uh, grabbing mushrooms. Um, but man, if you find the good ones, they are delicious. What else we got? So uh, that's always, um, that is always the question about recipes, right? So um, I am the world's worst about recipes because I am very reactive to food. I love to be inspired by what's fresh, what's in the market. Uh, and so I also am constantly kind of tweaking it based on what I have on hand. And as I mentioned, I, I like to have things that are uh, par cooked and par ready. So when you watch these videos, um, my, my friends at the Gastric Cancer Foundation uh, have been after me uh, with a pitchfork and a whip for years trying to get me to, to make recipes. And, and I will from time to time, as I'm doing these things, try to quantify things as I, as I go. What I would love for people to do is to kind of pay attention to the, the technique of kind of what I'm putting together and how I'm putting together and sort of the why, which I try to explain as we go along. And my analogy that I use, which um, some of you are going to roll your eyes when, when I say this, but uh, the Rolling Stones were just in, in Atlanta. And when you go to see the Rolling Stones, they don't hand you sheet music. They just play music and then you, you, know, you, you take something from that. And so I know I'm not the Rolling Stones, um, but I would love that you kind of take something away from this. And, and, um, and you know, Again, I kind of I kind of gave you the measurements as we went along, so you can go back and watch it. And uh, uh, our friend Laura, that helps at the GCF, she'll sometimes put uh, our recipes up there uh, as best as she can catch up with me. But um, I I promise I'm trying to get better at doing uh, recipes. I just feel like every time that I commit to okay, it's going to be a half a cup of onions. If it's the wrong season of onions, that might be too many. So I I would rather you learn to kind of listen to the ingredients and uh, and tweak them based on how spicy or salty or, or things they are. So, what else we got? And in fact, Laura just uh, mentioned all of the uh, recipes from the most recent series of superfoods are available. Oh, well, thank you, Laura. Um, so we are doing a, a series on superfoods. Uh, we've, gosh, we've gone through about half of them or more uh, so far, and we've got a few more to, uh, to, to do. And uh, Laura has been nice enough to try to capture my madness and turn them into recipes that are a replica. But again, none of the things I'm doing are, are, are meant to be difficult or uh, overly complicated. I, I try to keep them as simple as possible. Uh, and I want them to be something that anybody can recreate without having to grab a, a cookbook or a piece of paper uh, that they can go, oh, that was easy. He just threw these things in the pan. Because a lot of what I do is ultimately assemblage um, with par cooked items. Because I, again, my goal I'm not trying to win a James Beard Award for, you know, creating this new thing. I really am trying to make something that someone that is, that is in a position where they are GI compromised. Uh, and I, I joke sometimes that I don't have a GI doctor anymore because I don't have a G. I just have an eye doctor, but not an eye doctor. But anyway, um, I, my goal is to make it something that's simple and easy for you to do that, um, that doesn't feel like a challenge. I just had somebody recently ask me, I say recently, this was prior to the pandemic, at one of the last live classes I did, somebody pulled me aside and said, you know, how do, I, um, how do I arrange my life so I can spend less time in the kitchen? And my answer really was that I, I'm doing the opposite. I'm trying to figure out how can I spend more time in the kitchen? So rather than thinking of all of this stuff as a chore, enjoy your time in the kitchen. Turn on the music you like, put on a podcast, I know a good one. Um, and spend the time in the kitchen. Let that be kind of your time or, you know, involve your, your kids or um, just rather than thinking of it as a, as a chore, think about the times that you were in the hospital. Think about the times that you were connected to, you know, drainage tubes and thinking, man, I would give anything to not be in this hospital. Well, now you're in the kitchen uh, and I don't want to paint such a stark contrast, but man, 
being in the kitchen is not a chore versus the chore of the mountain that you climbed before. Celebrate that time in the kitchen. Enjoy that it's your time, it's your space to be creative, to, to learn a new skill uh, or to enhance an existing skill and make that time your own. What else we got? Anybody else? I'm going to take a mouth refresher here. Listen, I, um, I love doing these. It gives me exactly what I was talking about. It gives me an excuse to be in the kitchen, right? Hoping that I'm doing something that gives you a little bit of hope, gives you a little bit of something that you can build on and make your own. Um, I love it when, uh, in fact, the young lady standing right behind this camera told me that this cranberry, this easy cranberry thing, um, she learned that from me uh, doing a cooking show years ago and she's still doing it and people request it. That makes me feel so good that something that I did is now going on beyond me. So I'm hoping that whether it's these things, whether it's a simple act of, of doing your own sprouts or whether it's the, you know, the salad dressing I made a year ago in the Gesundheit kitchen, that you take those things and you modify them, you make them your own, they become a part of your story, your family's story. To me, that's the highest compliment. Um, but I also learn from, from other people. I've learned so much uh, you know, from, from working with patients one-on-one -on -one, what works for other people. Um, I met a, a gentleman from Brazil that um, boils bananas. He makes like a banana mash that was delicious. He does it with rice. Never even thought about that. But for him, after surgery, that was the one thing that he could eat. Uh, and, he, and he mixed in a, a protein powder. Um, so, you know, I would love for our social media to be a place where we can have these conversations, we can share ideas, uh, because I, I have never stopped learning from day one. Again, this has been a long 16-year journey for me. Uh, it's, it hasn't always been in a, it kind of looks like the stock market. Like when I look back and think, okay, I'm doing good and I'm not doing so good. And so there have been these peaks and valleys. And so when you are in those valleys, this community online, this organization, the Gesundheit uh, Kitchen and the Gastric Cancer Foundation, all of that has been such a foundation for me from which I know I might have these peaks and valleys, but I have that solid platform from which I can continue to grow and, and know that I am, uh, I'm a part of a much bigger community. And to me, that's when I was first diagnosed, that community didn't exist. And so I'm super proud how far we've come. I am uh, I'm super proud uh, of all we have accomplished as an organization. But again, um, it's great to see, you know, how much money we've raised and, and what that money's gone for. But ultimately, it's about the patient. It's about the patients that are uh, that are still th uh, surviving and thriving. It's about the patients that that we lost along the way. And that motivates us to you know, come together for a cure, which is kind of what's happening right now. So we are in our fundraising time. And uh, if, you, if you enjoy this program, if you, would, if you care about folks that, uh, that are going through gastric cancer, um, I would love it if you would take a moment and, uh, and donate whatever, whatever makes sense to you within, within your budget, or if you're a part of an organization that can, can make larger contributions, that is fantastic. Uh, I'm trying to put together, I've started playing pickleball, which is uh, a new thing for me, but I'm trying to get gears in motion for next year, putting together a pickleball tournament that'll uh, raise some money for the GCF. Um, so whatever you can do, um, I, I, would, I would give thanks. I would be very thankful uh, if you would help us as we continue to work towards uh, finding a cure for this, uh, this disease, which definitely took my life in a, in a, in a wide direction and I've tried to make the best out of it, um, but it's, there's a lot of folks who will, uh, even between now and the end of the year, get diagnosed, and they're gonna be scared, and they're gonna need that support and that help, and, and that's what we try to do. Um, last thing, any other, any other questions before we say goodbye and sayonara and avita zane and all of the, I don't know how to say uh, goodbye in Lithuanian. Uh, I'm not even sure what you speak in Lithuania, I'm embarrassed to say. I would assume Lithuanian. Um, but I'm embarrassed. I don't know that. Apparently, my great, uh, on my grand, on my paternal grandmother's side, her family was Lithuanian uh, way back in the day. So who knows? Um, anyway, thank you guys for joining us. This is a lot of fun. I'm going to feed my camera crew, and we're going to do more of these superfood uh, episodes. Um, again, your feedback is important. I don't need a pat on the head, but I I want to know if you're if uh, if this is helpful to you. And if there are things that you want to know about or things that uh, a direction you want me to go in, don't uh, don't hesitate to, to make those comments because it really does help us 
help us help you. So have a great holiday season. I'll look forward to seeing you again here in the Gazunda Kitchen. Until next time, guys, take care of yourself. Thanks to everybody in the room uh, for making this all happen. Sorry for the slight technical difficulty at the beginning, but uh, happy to know that we're, uh, we got this up and running and we had a good, uh, we had a good run. Thank you, everybody. Till next time.